Today I'm going to build my third and final bed in my bed building series. This time it's for my oldest son and I was actually surprised he had an opinion on the design. He wanted a dark gray bed with bookshelves built into the headboard. I designed a few options for him and he settled on this simple design. Well, it seems simple, but there are a lot of parts to this, so let's jump right in. I started by milling up the boards that will make up the headboard. I chose to use ash for this project because I think the grain in ash looks really cool when staying dark like he wanted. This is my first project since installing my dust collection system and having all the tools in the locations where I planned for them to be. And I am loving the workflow, except the miter saw. I still need to figure out where it should go. This location is just not working for me, but I'm loving my jointer so far. After cutting to rough length, planing, and squaring up one edge, I ripped all the parts to the same width. I needed 17 boards for the front and four for the back that will create the bookshelves. As a viewer, I am sure you're able to predict what's about to happen. I don't know how I didn't realize I was stacking them crooked like that. Anyway, the show must go on. There were a few pieces that got damaged in the fall, so I just made sure those pieces would be for the back panel of the bookshelf, and then I spent way longer than I should have rearranging the boards so they look as if they were randomly placed. Since I'll be gluing these into pretty large panels, I wanted to make sure they'll remain as flat as possible, so I'll be using dominoes to help with that. Before I got my domino, I used to do the same thing with dowels or biscuits. The results in all those different methods are the same, but I find the domino to be the easiest and least messy of the three. My goal was to make the headboard about 94 inches wide. I did not think it was wise to do that glue up in one fell swoop, so I split it up into three panels, and I also glued up the pieces that will make up the back of the bookshelf. Besides for ease of mind when gluing, Splitting up the headboard into three separate parts made it easier for me to flatten them at the drum sander, then I could lay out for the dominoes to connect the panels. At this point, I thought I was going to keep these panels separate until I install it in his room, so I didn't glue it up just yet, and I started working on the side rails and footboard. I mentioned I chose ash because I like how the grain looks when stained, but there was more thought into it than that. Other words I considered here were white oak and red oak. Before deciding, I went to woodworkersource.com where they have a project planner you can download that helps you figure out how much board footage you need for your projects. Based on the results from the chart, I compared prices for ash, white oak, and red oak. White oak for this bed would have cost around $637. Red oak, which is one of the least expensive hardwoods, would have cost around $412. Ash, in my opinion, has a nicer grain than red oak, and it only came in around $65 higher with a cost of about $477, so to me, that was a no-brainer. Most of the bed will be made of ash, but there are some parts that won't be visible, like the support base that I'll work on next. Since these parts won't be seen, I could get away with an even less expensive wood, poplar. I happened to have these three boards left over from our house construction, so I felt like they were free, even though they weren't. <laughs> the support base is made up of four parts. There are two long sides and two short pieces making up the front and back. The back piece will be assembled in between the two long sides, and the front piece will be assembled so that it's overlapping the two long sides. The inner back piece gets cut to length first, then the outer front piece gets cut to length based on the actual thickness of the parts. I think this will make more sense when I assemble it. Moving on, I sorted through the poplar that I got from Woodworker Source to find the longest pieces that I can mill into all my support rails. This bed is kind of like a floating platform bed, so the basic construction is different than what I've built in the past, where I've only needed one middle support rail because the bed had a footboard with feet that supported the side rails. For this design, the side rails and footboard need extra support since they're floating, so I need six support rails in total. The support base will sit on the floor, then three short side-to-side -side supports will go across the base, and three long front-to-back supports will go on top of those running the length of the base. I didn't like that the long front-to-back rails weren't sitting flush on the base, so I decided to inset the short side-to-side -side supports into some dados. 
I find it's more accurate and efficient to cut joinery in multiple parts at the same time. So I clamped the two sides of the support base together and marked out for dados using a cutoff from the rails as my guide. I considered setting up a dado stack to make these cuts, but these two long boards clamped together were quite heavy, so I decided to bring the tool to the workpiece instead. I made a quick right angle guide for this mini circular saw and made two cuts to define the width of each dado. Then just went to town taking multiple passes in between the initial cuts. At first I thought of an overcomplicated router jig to make these joints, but sometimes it's just best to keep it simple. There are so many ways that a dado like this can be created. This is one of the simplest, but smashing the cut parts also makes it the most fun. Last step is to clean up the joint. When I set up the circular saw, I set the blade to cut slightly shallower than the thickness of the material. Now I set a pattern bit in my trim router to the exact depth I need based on the material. In a matter of seconds, the joint is cleaned up to perfection. These dados are wider than the base of my router, so having the extra large surface area of my six and one jig is super handy here. We were sold out of these jigs for a while, but they're back in stock, so I'll drop a link down below if you wanna check it out. Okay, now you see the short side to side supports fit perfectly in those dados and the long front to back supports will now sit flush on the base. On typical beds, there's a mattress slat support ledge that's attached to the inside of the side rails, but this is a floating frame bed. So that mattress slat support ledge is also going to act as the support for the whole side rail. I could have milled up material that was just the thickness I needed from the top of the side to side supports to the bottom of the mattress flats, but I decided to use thicker material and make dados so the bed frame will snap together in the correct locations when I go to assemble it all. And this caused my biggest problem on this build. You'll see in a bit. Anyway, I made these dados the same way I did the first ones. Clamp both pieces together, rough cut with a circular saw, clean up with a pattern bit. So satisfying when it all fits together nicely. But notice how this is supposed to fit. The dados need to be facing down. The footboard will also get a support ledge, but the dados on this one should be facing up. Since these dados will be holding the long front to back supports that sit on top of the short side to side supports, which again will make sense when you see me assemble it at the end. As you can see, I use the crosscut sled to cut these, always options. Here we go. Pay close attention here. I pre-drilled and countersunk holes into the support ledges, added glue, then used a combo square to make sure the ledge was the correct distance from the top of the side rails and screwed it into place. Notice I said top and also notice how those dados are facing up when they're supposed to be facing down. And this is when I realized. So frustrating. Now watch as I go into complete panic mode, trying to remove the ledge. <laughs> oh, this is a really bad mistake. Okay. It's not budging. swap this piece and put it here. So I'll just cut this away and glue it in. Hopefully that works. So after about 15 minutes of panicking and trying to pry the ledge off, I decided I'm no match against wood glue and I could repair it by cutting away the bottom of the dado and reattaching it to the other side. The piece that was cut away was too small for the opening though because of the kerf cut by the saw. So I milled up another piece that was the same thickness as those cut away pieces, cut them to size, and now they're a perfect fit. I glued them in, but these dados were really meant to support the whole side rail. So I didn't trust glue alone. 
these needed to be reinforced. I considered a bunch of different ways to add a spline between these parts, but thought the domino could work to quickly cut a slot between them, and it worked out great. I just lined up the center line on the base of the domino with the joint and made sure the base was flush with the bottom before cutting. Now a domino gets glued into those slots, acting as a spline between the parts. Problem solved. While I'm really happy with this fix, I really wish I didn't have to think of it. With that out of the way, I could work on how all these parts will go together. For the support base, I went with a combination. I cut in dominoes in all the parts, but they'll really only be used for alignment. I will actually join them all with pocket holes. Yep, this is a perfect application for pocket holes. They will never be seen, and no one needs to know they exist except you and me. The side rails and footboard will also get a combination. The dominoes again for alignment and brackets that I'll use during final assembly. Even though the domino is an amazing tool, you can still mess up when you're using it. I almost cut on the outside face of the footboard. I almost just made a huge mistake. Thank God I caught that. so bad. Okay. That's why it's so important to label all of your parts. I glue dominoes in the end of the side rails, but I won't be permanently attaching them to the footboard. These are strictly for alignment purposes so I can temporarily connect the parts and sand all the edges flush with each other. Having dominoes in there will ensure they'll be in the exact same spot when I do the final assembly in his room. You could do the same exact thing with dowels. Since this bed design is very simple, I thought I would jazz it up a bit by making the headboard bookshelves out of walnut, which I also got from Woodworker Source. The shelves are only going to be about four and three quarter inches wide by 11 inches deep. So this might seem a bit confusing as to why I didn't just rip those boards to four and three quarters wide, then chop them to the length of 11 inches. That would be the simplest way to do it, but it doesn't take grain direction into account. So instead, I glued up a panel that was just over 11 inches wide to get the shelf depth I'll need and also glued up an ash panel for the bottom pieces. If I would have done it the simple way, there would be two problems. The front edge of the shelf would be end grain, which in my opinion is not as nice to look at in this situation, and two, wood movement the shelves would expand and contract widthwise into the cabinet sides. By doing it this way, where I had to glue up a panel to create the shelf depth, the shelves will expand and contract lengthwise into the cabinet opening, creating less problems. After planing flat and ripping all the parts to 11 inches, I cut the shelves to width using a stop block at the crosscut sled. Now you can see the grain orientation on those narrow shelves where the front will be nice looking edge grain. Before moving on, I milled up some more poplar for the mattress support slats. While this seems like a premature step in this build, I've learned my lesson from previous projects that it's best to do these seemingly mundane tasks early on in the process so you're not struggling to find material on install day. So I got all these parts completely prepped now by ripping to width, cutting to length, and drilling countersunk holes towards the ends. There's one more piece I need to prep, the 94 inch long bookshelf ledge that will sit on top of the headboard. Only problem, I don't have any pieces that are 94 inches long. So I took whatever pieces were left over from milling the slats that made up the headboard and prepped them into pieces that will create a 94 inch long board. I put dominoes in the end grain of all the boards to keep them level with each other and just glued them all together and they say there's no such thing as a board stretcher. This piece really won't be visible on the bed, so doing this glue up was totally cool with me. It cleaned up really quickly at the planer, and then I ripped it to final width. All parts are prepped, back to the headboard. My original idea was to keep these panels separate until install day and just secure them together with battens on the back because it would be easier to handle three small panels over one ginormous panel but I was worried about getting that joint tight on install day, especially after sanding and finish, even with dominoes in place like what I did with the side rails. So I decided to just go for it. Struggle with maneuvering this monstrosity while it's in my shop, so install day will go smoothly. As you can see, I don't have clamps long enough to join these two panels, so I had to clamp the clamps 
to clamps to clamp it closed. This works okay, but I didn't like that I couldn't easily get two clamps to span the length of the panels from underneath to balance out the pressure. So when attaching the third panel, I went with ratchet straps. If you don't own ratchet straps, I highly suggest picking some up because this turned out great. Now that the headboard's all glued up, I can use its exact dimensions to trim the bookshelf ledge I glued up earlier to final length. And once the glue on the headboard panel was dry, I could trim that up as well. I had to join two tracks together to span the length of this headboard, but it trimmed up really easily. Not so easy, flipping it over so I could work on the backside. I was starting to regret my decision of gluing this all up. And also while editing, I'm wondering why I didn't just glue it up so the backside was facing up. This way I wouldn't have to flip it at all because all the work I really need to do on this is on the backside. You know what they say about hindsight. Regardless, I got it done and moved on with assembling the bookshelves. The Domino was really the MVP of this build. But I'm gonna be honest, it's still a new tool for me, so I'm not 100% comfortable with it just yet. I need to do test cuts into scrap material every single time I use it because I don't trust myself with the settings just yet, and I am shocked every time the joints fit perfectly. So here's how these shelves will go together. A back panel will be dominoed into the back of the headboard, then a side panel will be dominoed into the back panel. Then the shelves will be dominoed into the back of the headboard and the inside of the side panel. When cutting the mortises in the panels, I took a risk here by not setting up a straight edge for the domino to reference and to just use my eye to line it up with the reference lines. I did use the loose setting for the mortises where the shelves would be attached so I can adjust as needed. Next up, there was lots and lots of sanding, but I won't bore you with that footage. One important thing to note is that I will be using a water-based dye, so I needed to raise the grain with water before doing my final pass of 220 grit. Before starting this project, I did a lot of testing to get the right color finish my son wanted. I'm a big fan of Osmo oil, so I wanted to try their wood wax finish, which comes in a bunch of different colors. But like many other stains, I noticed the color wasn't getting as dark as I would like because of the difference in early wood versus late wood. The late wood is more dense and does not absorb stain as well as the early wood. To combat this, I dyed the wood first with a powdered dye. Here you can see both of these boards were finished with Osmo wood wax in different colors, but this darker one was dyed with gray aniline dye first. I followed the directions of the powdered dye for mixing ratio and applied it to all the parts that will be inside of the bookshelf. Finishing these parts before assembly is just the way to go especially since the bookshelf sides are getting a different treatment than the walnut shelves. Applying the dye is super simple, just brush on and wipe off the excess. Notice the painter's tape though. Since I'm pre-finishing these parts, I need to avoid getting finish on any areas where glue will need to go. This was my first time using this Osmo wood wax finish, but the application process is the same as their other finishes, which is apply thinly and wipe off the excess. The can said only one coat was required, but I wanted to add another layer of protection. I was worried if I added another layer of the black, it would be too black and I really wanted a dark gray. So the following day for the second coat, I used the granite gray color and I'm really happy with the results of this combination. Exactly what I was looking for. Dark gray, but still being able to see a little bit of the wood tone underneath and my son was happy, so all good. While I was waiting for finish to dry, I wrote a little message on the back of the headboard for him and added finish to the back to keep everything nice and even. You can also see here how much lighter the stain is without the use of dye beforehand. The walnut shelves got two coats of regular Ol Osmo over the course of two days, then it was time for assembly. I removed the painter's tape and had to be very mindful of the order of operations here. First, dominoes were glued into the sides of the shelves. Then those shelves were attached to the side panel. 
dominoes were then glued into the back panel, which was then glued onto the side panel. Now dominoes could be glued into the other side of all the shelves and the side of the back panel. That whole assembly could then be flipped over and glued to the back of the headboard, then repeat on side two. I haven't even touched the front of the headboard yet. Everything you've seen thus far has only been the back. So I'm gonna have to repeat all the sanding and finishing steps to the front. This added two days of work because you have to wait eight to 10 hours between coats of Osmo. But you saw what happened when I tried to flip this thing once. <laughs> I thought it was wise to add a couple of days to the project then to get on the struggle bus. You may have noticed when I was flipping it earlier that it was quite wobbly. So I added a few crossbars to the back to reinforce it. These are attached through oversized holes to allow for wood movement. I also felt like the bookshelf ledge was going to need a bit of extra support in the middle. So I attached a support block to the back with pocket holes and all the work that needs to be done to the back is over so I can flip it over and repeat the sanding and finishing process on the front side. Yay. Same as before, sand till 220, raise the grain with water, then sand again with 220 to knock down all the fuzz, apply dye, let dry, apply Osmo black, wait 10 hours, apply Osmo granite gray, wait another 10 hours. That's a lot of work. This was definitely a time consuming process, which is why I'm so happy to get meals delivered to my door from this week's sponsor, Green Chef. Whether you're looking for healthier choices for breakfast, lunch, or dinner that fit your lifestyle, Green Chef has you covered because Green Chef is a CCOF certified organic meal kit company with options for every lifestyle, including keto and paleo, vegan, vegetarian, fast and fit, Mediterranean, and gluten-free. Personally, I don't really have an eating lifestyle. I just like wholesome, high quality food that tastes great. And I get all that with Green Chef and their always changing variety of easy to follow recipes. Every time a box gets delivered to my door, I can't wait to see what's inside. My kids also get really excited, but we're excited for different reasons. They love trying something new. I love not going to the supermarket and spending time meal planning. With Green Chef, most of the prep is done for you week after week so you can make more time to achieve other goals like sanding and finishing jumbo headboards. With these pre-portioned, easy to follow recipes delivered right to your door, it's never been easier to hit your wellness goals. So if you want to check out these meal kits that contain a variety of organic produce, premium proteins, and sustainably sourced seafood, use my code 3x3custom60 to get 60% off plus free shipping on your first box. Go to greenchef.com for more details. Once again, use my code 3x3custom60 to get 60% off plus free shipping on your first box at greenchef.com. That really was a lot of work and my back was killing me, but all worth it. Last step, not sure what happened to the footage here, but I put the bookshelf ledge in place and Brad nailed it to the supports on the back and it's time for final assembly. I started with the back of the support base, which snapped in place because of the dominoes used for alignment. Then I locked it in place with pocket hole screws. Now the front of the support base gets attached in the same way to the sides. Side note, this black Osmo finish looked really cool on the poplar, something to remember for future projects. Next, I called in for reinforcements for the headboard. Because of the layout of our house, Thank God we didn't have to carry it up any stairs and we could roll it through the hallways into his room. When we did need to lift it, the shelves made a perfect lifting point, a testament to how strong these joints are. I put some felt furniture feet under the headboard to protect the floors and align the center of the support base with the center of the headboard. Off camera, I drilled these countersunk oversized holes on the inside face of that back panel and simply attached it with washers and screws. Now the short side to side supports go across the base in the dados and I used scrap pieces of wood to hold up the side rails while I placed them on those side to side supports. This is why those dados needed to be reinforced when I fixed my mistake. That ledge is actually supporting the side rail. The footboard goes on next. Temporarily being held up with scrap wood, I banged it into the dominoes that are on the side rails. Remember, those dominoes were just there for alignment purposes for this moment right here. 
Everything was looking gap free, so I countersunk holes in the support ledges and locked them down to the side to side supports with screws on both sides. I made sure there was an even overhang from the support base all around, then locked the side to side supports to the main support base with screws. I triple checked the side rails were square to the headboard, then I simply used metal corner brackets with screws to attach them to the headboard. I used the same brackets to attach the side rails to the footboard. I used two brackets on each corner, one on top of the ledge and one on the bottom of the ledge. The scrap blocks can be removed now and the frame is officially floating, but it needs a bit more support. That's where the long front to back supports come in. These fit right on top into the dados that are facing up on the footboard. I countersunk holes in all those support pieces and locked them all together, making sure to offset some of the locations as not to run into any of the screws underneath. And one last support measure. I know my kids. I placed an upright center support post under the middle of the long support rail, drilled a couple of holes through both pieces, then locked them together with a glued dowel. I don't like putting screws in end grains, so this dowel connection makes more sense to me. Last up, the mattress slats are placed and I used a spacer block between each slat to make sure they're evenly spaced apart. I usually have my kids help me with this, but good luck finding them when the weather's nice and it's baseball season. All that's left to do is drop a mattress in place and it's done. I tried to get a big reveal of my son seeing his bed for the first time, but he went in there before I had the chance to capture it. I'll just tell you he's really happy with it and I think it's pretty cool too. It's a modern, simple, sleek design, but super functional with storage built into the headboard. I love how these walnut shelves look with this dark gray color. It took me a minute to figure out how I would support the floating frame, but I think I nailed it. I don't love the corner brackets, but I think they made the most sense here. Testing out finishes for the color he wanted was also a challenge, and I think the depth of color from the multi-step process turned out exactly how we both envisioned it. I love seeing the grain in the ash, but the color is dark and moody. It almost looks like the wood was burnt without having to go through that process. Very pleased. The thing that strikes me the most with this build is that one of my first projects ever was a queen size bed that took me over two months to build. And this one took me under two weeks. And it's just so much more refined. Looking at it, I'm just so proud of how far I've come in my woodworking journey. And I can't wait to learn more. So I just keep getting better and better. Hope you guys like this project as much as I did. Thanks for watching. I'll see you on the next one. So the jointer is like the most dangerous tool. So I don't want you going near the jointer. How does it work? How does it work? There's like a lot of different knives on it and it just spins. It's like knives spinning, 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 spinning. So imagine what would happen if your hand goes near that. Bye bye hand. Bye bye hand. <laughs> That's right. <laughs>